threats, risks, controls, privacy, ethics and governance. In this study unit. 1. Introduction The purpose of this study unit is firstly to create an understanding of the common risks and threats faced by an information system. Thereafter, the importance of implementing appropriate and effective computer controls, including information technology governance to address these threats, will be explained. Concerns regarding privacy and ethics in a computerized information system will be raised and possible measures to alleviate these concerns discussed. In the previous study unit, we looked at Internet, Intranet, Extranet, as well as Internet of Things. 2. Vulnerability, Threat, Exposure, and Risks According to Boys et al., 2017, it is important to understand that although the terms vulnerability, threat, exposure and risk are often used interchangeably, they all have different meanings. Once you understand what these four concepts entail, the relationship between them will also be clear. Vulnerability refers to a security weakness or flaw in the information system that creates an opportunity for an attack on confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the information, CIA triad. The potential exists that vulnerabilities might be exploited, either intentionally or accidentally. This potential is known as a threat. The existence of vulnerabilities in the system exposes the organization to financial losses and can be expressed as a function of the financial impact and the probability that these events will occur. A risk can be explained as the likelihood of an attack on information assurance occurring, that is, the probability of the vulnerability being exploited, and can therefore be quantified. Risk is seen as some combination of a threat, exploiting some vulnerability, that could cause harm to an asset. Cyber risk is a focus area for organizations. It is the risk of financial loss, disruption, or damage to an organization caused by issues with the information technology systems they use. 3. Risk of Security Vulnerabilities Being aware of the vulnerabilities that could create problems for an organization is one thing, but being aware of the implications of the vulnerabilities is also vital. According to ACC underscore SIMAC, vulnerabilities can be classified as either technical, procedural, or physical. Technical deficiencies include issues like defects in the software being used, or not using appropriate protection, such as encryption, correctly. Procedural deficiencies are either IT-related, for example, system configuration mistakes or not keeping software security patches up to date, or user-related, for example, not complying with company guidelines on changing passwords or using passwords that are too simple. Physical occurrences, or a physical event, like a fire or flood, causes damage to the information technology system. Whatever the reason for the vulnerability, its exploitation can lead to costly problems for the organization involved. For Information Security Management Systems, ISMS The International Organization for Standardization, ISO, produced standard ISO 27001 which concerns information security management systems. It serves as a framework that focuses on all aspects of an organization's information risk management processes. The standard was also developed to provide a model for establishing, implementing, operating, monitoring, reviewing, maintaining, and improving an information security management system. The key principle behind the standard, in line with the AICPA approach, is to ensure a proactive rather than reactive approach to cybersecurity risk management. Given the high regard for ISO standards, a lot of larger organizations require B2B partners to be ISO 27001 compliant or to be progressing towards compliance before they will do business with them, thus it is further risk mitigation. 5. Cyber Risks of Social Media to Organizations As always, with opportunity there are also risks. Some of the risks presented by social media Human error, a mistake by an employee could range from being hacked after clicking on fraudulent links on their work computer, to making inappropriate comments on social media, either through their personal account, or if they have access to it, via the company account. 
Productivity, while there are clearly positives to be gained from social media, if employees can access social media at work, it can disrupt their work and reduce the operational efficiency of the company. Data protection, regulatory requirements are increasing around how companies gather, use and store data about their customers. Firms need to make sure they have secure networks, and they comply with all legislation. Hacking, as with any computer program, a hacker may try to infiltrate social media accounts for malicious reasons, or use social media accounts to harvest data to assist with a social engineering attack, like phishing, or a business email compromise attack. Reputation, any mistakes a company makes on social media, such as an inappropriate post made by a staff member, could have a negative impact on the brand of the organization and result in lost customers, sales, or even employees. Inactivity, as maintaining an online presence becomes increasingly important, not using social media or not keeping existing accounts up to date, could be as damaging as using it badly. Costs, in theory, using social media costs nothing, but to use it well and control the accompanying risks could cost a significant amount. Also, any fines from non-compliance with regulations could also be significant. 6. Cyber Risks of Cloud and Mobile Computing The following are the risks. Reliance on the service provider, as with any outsourcing decision, relying on the cloud service provider means that any failings at the service provider could be more problematic without backup plans for bringing services back in-house. There are not only issues with the trust and security required from the service provider, it also needs to be considered whether the provider's services are suitable for the tasks required, whether the technology is advanced enough to give adequate competitiveness, whether the service provider will continue as a going concern, whether the service provider can ensure continuity in the light of external events such as system failure, whether initial prices will be maintained, and so forth. Regulatory risks Data security is often highly regulated in terms of what can be stored, who can access it, how long it can be stored for, and how it can be used. Organizations will be reliant on cloud service providers for this compliance. This may become a problem if the service provider is based in a different jurisdiction with different regulations and rules. Unauthorized access to business and customer data, this can come in two forms. Firstly, the cloud service provider is more likely to be a target of hacking than the individual small businesses that use it. If the service provider is targeted, all users suffer, even if they were not individual targets themselves. Secondly, providing business and customer data to an outsourced service provider means that the data can be accessed by that service provider's staff. It will also be important that the service provider does not share this data with unauthorized users such as other users of that service provider's services. 7 Threats to an Information System Most organizations use an information system to process financial and operational data. Various threats may exist in such an environment because of system flaws. For example, due to human error, revenue may be overstated in an instance where an invoice amount is captured as R400000 instead of R400000. However, the spotlight in this section will fall on potential threats in a computerized information system rather than a manual information system. As explained earlier, threats exist because of certain vulnerabilities. These threats can be caused by nature, for example natural disasters, the environment, such as power failures, or human error. 7.1 Cyber Criminal Tools on Networks and Slash or Computers Hacking is the gaining of unauthorized access to a computer system. It might be a deliberate attempt to gain access to an organization's systems and files to obtain information or to alter data, perhaps fraudulently. Once hackers have gained access to the system, there are several damaging options available to them. For example, they may Gain access to the file that holds all the user ID codes, passwords, and authorizations. Discover the method used for generating or authorizing passwords.
interfere with the access control system to provide the hacker with open access to the system. Obtain information which is of potential use to a competitor organization. Obtain, enter, or alter data for a fraudulent purpose. Cause data corruption by the introduction of unauthorized computer programs and processing onto the system, computer viruses. Alter or delete files to a competitor organization. Hackers is a broad term, but there are different types of hackers, defined according to their reason for hacking. Regardless of their reason, they all require a certain level of skill. Unethical hackers, these are the stereotypical hackers that hack with malicious intent. They typically break into secure systems and networks to steal data, destroy it or perhaps just modify it. Critically, it is all done without the company's permission. Ethical hackers usually hack with the company's permission. They are trying to help the company understand what an unethical hacker may try to do so it can protect the computer network. Some people describe the ethical hacker as a security expert. IP spoofing means to forge the source IP address, thereby concealing the actual IP address and making it appear to be the IP address of a trusted or authorized source. This enables the cyber criminal to remain anonymous while carrying out criminal activities. For example, by using IP spoofing, a criminal can send a fake sales order to an organization, which seemingly comes from a legitimate client. This organization might then manufacture and deliver goods that were never ordered, thereby incurring unnecessary costs. Computer forgery takes place when advanced computer technology and programs are used to forge documents for example official letterheads, matric certificates, degrees, and identity documents. These forged documents are then used to commit fraud. Computer fraud can be defined as any fraudulent activity where a computer, computer system, or network is used to unlawfully take, alter, or use information or computer programs. Examples of computer fraud include altering accounting transaction data to conceal unauthorized, fraudulent transactions or deliberate altering of a computer program's logic to calculate interest incorrectly for the benefit of the computer fraudster. Computer-related scams are a subsection of computer fraud and usually offer too good to be true deals, requiring sensitive personal information from the victim or money to be paid into the cyber criminal's bank account. For example, the victim is informed, via email, that he has won a large amount of money in a foreign lottery and that the money will be paid out after the receipt of an amount of money for administration fees. Malware is the term used for malicious software, regardless of the intended purpose. It can do any number of things, ranging from the stealing of credentials, other information, or money to the general wreaking of havoc or denial of service. There are various ways to execute malware, including Ransomware is designed to prevent a business from accessing its data, information, or a whole computer system until a specified amount of money is paid. Botnets are networks of private computers that are infected with malware and controlled by a botnet agent designed to follow the attacker's instructions without the knowledge of the owner of the computer, ACC underscore ACAC underscore BT underscore 202109, 2021. Trojans are named after the Trojan horse in an ancient Greek story where a wooden horse was allowed into the city as it was deemed harmless, but which concealed soldiers inside, ready to attack the city. This type of malware does a very similar thing. It pretends to be a useful piece of software while secretly releasing malware into the system, usually with the capability to be controlled by the attacker from a different location, known as a remote access Trojan or RIT. Once on the system, it can then prevent access to the system, ransomware, infect the system damaging and destroying files, or act as spyware. Trojans refer to malicious software designed to destroy and interrupt business operation and information through illegal access and use. A computer virus is a program or programming code that replicates or copies itself repeatedly without the user's knowledge or consent. Viruses spread via attachments to emails and downloaded files or are copied to a USB flash drive. 
A worm is also a self-replicating program or program code but differs from a virus in the sense that it does not need to be attached to an existing program. These copies are sent via the computer network to other computers in the network. A logic bomb is an intentionally inserted program code that will set off a malicious function, for example, delete or corrupt data or files, when triggered under certain conditions. A rootkit is a tool that grants an attacker continuous full access to a computer while hiding its presence. A well-written rootkit can rewrite a computer's login script, which will then accept the cyber criminal's login even if the user or administrator tries to change it. Spyware is, as the name says, software that spies on a user. The spyware program will secretly transmit personal information or web browsing habits to a cyber criminal. The user is typically unaware of this invasion of privacy. Advertisements rooted in a software package, which typically display as a pop-up message, are known as adware. The purpose of adware is to generate web traffic and obtain email addresses. A blended threat is a combination of different malware used to exploit the vulnerabilities in a system. Identity theft occurs when personal information is acquired and used fraudulently without the owner's knowledge or consent, for example, targeting tourists during a world sport event to steal their identity documents or passports. Identity theft is not limited to natural persons but also entails the theft of an organization's identity. Identity theft is used to obtain goods and services fraudulently, such as withdrawing money from the victim's bank account, blackmail, terrorism, illegal migration, and so on. Criminals steal a person's identity by stealing emails, going through garbage, wallets and handbags, spyware, and so forth. Other methods used include social engineering, shoulder surfing, and phishing. Social engineering means to study the user's social networking profile or chat rooms to get clues on what the user's password might be, as people usually use something familiar as their password, for example, the name of a loved one or a pet, a favorite musician or writer. Shoulder surfing refers to shadowing the targeted user to accidentally see or hear the password. Phishing literally means to fish for sensitive personal information, such as usernames, passwords, online banking login details, and credit card details. Phishing misleads the victim into thinking that electronic correspondence has been sent by a trustworthy source, for example, a financial institution, thereby luring the victim to a spoofed, fraudulent, website. At this spoofed website, the victim is requested to divulge sensitive personal information. Both the email and the spoofed website usually appear to be those of legitimate organizations. It is important to train users to be aware of the danger of phishing attacks. A denial of service DDoS, attack overwhelms a system's resources so that it cannot respond to service requests. A distributed denial of service DDoS, attack is also an attack on a system's resources, but it is launched from a large number of other host machines that have already been infected by malicious software controlled by the attacker. Injection with SQL, structured query language, has become a common issue with database-driven websites. It occurs when the attacker uses an unprotected input box on the company's website to execute a SQL query to the database via the input data from the client to server. A successful SQL injection can read sensitive data from the company's database, modify, insert, update or delete database data, execute administration operations, such as shutdown, on the database, recover the content of a given file, and, in some cases, issue commands to the operating system. Cross-site scripting attacks, XSS attacks, occur when a victim is attacked when they visit another organization's website. The attacker uses the third-party web resources to run scripts in the victim's web browser or scriptable application. Specifically, the attacker injects malicious code, often associated with JavaScript, into a website's database. When the victim requests a page from the website, the website transmits the page, with the attacker's code as part of the HTML body, to the victim's browser, which executes the malicious script. For example, it might send the victim's cookie to the attacker's server, and the attacker can extract it and use it for session hijacking. Buffer overflow attack, 
A buffer overflow occurs when a system cannot store as much information as it has been sent and consequently starts to overwrite existing content. A buffer overflow attack occurs when an attacker sends a malicious program which deliberately overloads the system and starts to overwrite existing data. 8. Controls Controls can be classified using various methods. Two of the most common ways are according to the type of control, which includes general and application controls, or by the function of the control, which includes prevention, detection, and correction. Specific system controls should be implemented to ensure reliable data communication and the safeguarding of assets. It is important to take into account that a control can fall into more than one category. For example, the control of duty segregation can be classified as both a general and preventive control, Boys et al., 2017. 8.1 General Controls these review the reliability of the data generated by the IT systems and check that they are operating correctly. General controls include Physical controls, these involve controls to avoid unauthorized access to computer equipment, such as security personnel, door locks and card entry systems. They also include safeguards against possible environmental damage to the computer equipment, such as surge protectors in case of lightning strikes or other power surges. Hardware and software configuration. These controls are designed to ensure that any new IT is tested and installed correctly into the system to minimize the risk of errors or damage to the systems. Logical access. These controls are designed to prevent unauthorized access to the organization's information systems. These could include password systems. Disaster recovery. These will ensure that the organization will be able to continue operating despite adverse conditions. For example, off-site backup may be kept of all systems. Output controls. These ensure that the outputs from the system are both complete and secure. This could include controls over whom outputs, such as reports or lists, are distributed to within the organization. Technical support. It is important that all the users of the organization's IT systems are competent. Training policies and technical support for workers can be a valuable control. General controls. Organizational segregation of duties within each task in the transaction control cycle should be present. By segregation of duties, we mean that one single staff member should not be responsible for the initiation, authorization, processing and review of a transaction. In a computerized transaction processing system, the segregation of duties regarding system development and data processing is extremely important. Operational controls every task within the transaction processing system must be described in a procedure manual. These manuals should be kept in a safe place, such as a fireproof safe. Only competent staff should be appointed to take responsibility for the transaction processing system. Training will also ensure staff competence. Rotation of tasks assigned to certain staff should be done on a random basis. A sound control environment starts with management in a top-down approach. Management could implement general controls, for example, compiling a policy on changes, or development system procedures and human resource policies and practices that make a commitment to excellence. Controls to protect the IT environment The information center is the place where all the information system activities take place. The controls listed below are all examples of restricting access to the computer or information. Controls against human access to the information center should be implemented. These controls include fences around the restricted area, locks and keys to restrict access to the information center, key staff wearing badges to tell them apart from intruders, physically inspecting the restricted area and consulting a logging access report of the area over a specific period. It could also include installing biometric access controls, which involve using computer software to identify fingerprints, handprints, voice patterns, signatures, and retinal scans of individuals authorized to enter the restricted area.
Access to computer and information, access control software ensures only authorized users obtain access to powerful programs and sensitive information by controlling and monitoring user access and the way information is shared between users. Access control software firstly controls the identification of users, that is, users need to identify themselves, usually through user IDs, login IDs, or unique account numbers, your bank account number, for example. The user is then taken through an authentication process, e.g., entering a password, to verify the user is the person he, she claims to be. After users have been identified and authenticated as authorized users, access control lists will define the specific programs and data they have access to and what permissions they have, read, write, copy, etc. Different permissions and access to programs and data can be assigned to different users. For example, only the human resources manager and the divisional manager will have access to individual staff members' salaries on the staff system. The financial clerk will only have access to totals for the entire division's salary bill to enable him, her to process the necessary transactions in the financial system. The human resource manager might only have view, read, access of the salary bill in the financial system while the financial clerk will have processing, write, rights. It is management's responsibility to ensure the implementation of an access control policy. Passwords, usernames and personal identification keys, PIN, are effective ways of preventing unwanted computer access. Individuals should take care when selecting passwords, PINs, or usernames that they will not be easily identifiable or obvious for intruders. Passwords should include numbers, capital letters and special characters and should not be a word related to your everyday life. Also, never divulge your password, especially not to somebody you do not know very well. Firewalls are technological barriers designed to prevent unauthorized or unwanted communication between computer networks or hosts. Encryption, this is a process of transforming information into a readable format and is a measure of control. Encryption is the conversion of data into a form called ciphertext that cannot be easily understood by unauthorized people. Decryption is the process of converting encrypted data back into its original form so that it can be understood. Controls against natural elements are very important for preventing or minimizing the impact of disasters, and include the following. Disaster planning is discussed in the next section. Backup power, in the form of an uninterrupted power supply, UPS, generators or solar power to prevent damage to equipment or loss of information in the case of power failures. Smoke detectors, which alert staff and emergency services to the possibility of a fire. Early detection can help to prevent or limit the damage to computer equipment and save lives. The information center should have sufficient fire extinguishing equipment in order to prevent the spread of fires in emergencies. If the floor in the information center is raised, it will prevent water damage from flooding. Temperature control in the information center is necessary to prevent damage, as computer systems should be kept at a constant temperature. It is important to pay a monthly insurance fee to enable the organization to replace computer equipment in the event of damage or loss. Maintenance on computer equipment should be done on a regular basis to monitor the usability of hardware. IT Asset Accountability Controls Controls ensuring the accuracy of information should be implemented and executed by staff who are not responsible for processing or capturing of transactions, for example. The details of control accounts in the general ledger should be documented in subsidiary accounts. Reconciliation should be prepared by a staff member who is not involved in capturing and reviewed by an independent senior staff member. Boys et al., 2017 8.2 Application Controls These controls are fully automated and tend to be designed to ensure that the data input into the system is complete and accurate. 
These controls will vary from system to system but are often designed to ensure Completeness, has all necessary data been input? Authorization, is the person inputting the data authorized to do so? Identification, can the person inputting the information be uniquely identified? Validity, is the information being input by the user valid? Forensic checks, is the information being input by the user mathematically accurate? Application controls are specific to the functioning of individual applications. Application controls relating to a computerized information system comprise the following. Application controls. Input controls. The purpose of input controls is to prevent and detect errors when entering information into the information system in order to ensure validity, timeliness, and accuracy. Input edit checks of transaction data, for example, check digits, incorrect dates or date formats, completeness checks to ensure no blank fields are recorded, and visual verification to confirm the general reasonability of documentation. See discussion on programmed edit checks under detective controls as well. Data transcription, for example, using a batch control log, batch serial numbers. Data observation and recording, using record counts, control totals or other ways to balance the input totals with the source documents. Transmission of transaction data by using, for example, transmittal documents, batch control tickets, or readbacks, where the sender immediately receives feedback on the input information for comparison and approval purposes. Processing controls Processing controls are designed to ensure that all transaction data has been processed accurately and in time. When the processed information is reviewed, the reviewer needs to confirm that no data was lost, altered, or added during processing. Processing controls are also important to ensure that the database and files stay maintained. Examples of processing controls include the following. Physical inspections and checks, these may include reconciliations, checking the work of another employee, and acknowledgments. Logic checks, programmed edit checks, such as sequence and reasonableness checks, may also be applied in processing. For example, an input value should not be zero when there will be a number that divides it somewhere in a program. See discussion under detective controls to see how this works. Run to run totals, to ensure batch data are completely and accurately transferred between processes, Output control totals are calculated and used as input control totals for the next processing sequence, thereby linking the one process to the next. Audit trails, an audit trail is a set of steps put in place to keep proof of each action taken to execute a business process, for example, keeping complete original records, like receipts, of petty cash transactions. It enables individual transactions to be traced, provides support for general ledger balances, provides data to prepare financial reports with and corrects errors where applicable. Output controls Output controls ensure the reliability and integrity of output information after the input and processing phase. The output information should be reconciled to the input data based on documented procedures. Discrepancy reports should be generated and investigated. Files should be verified and audited on a surprise basis. Boys et al., 2017. 8.3 Controls Classified by Function There are three key types of control that can be considered. 8.4 Preventive Controls These are controls that prevent errors or fraud occurring. 
For example, authorization controls should prevent fraudulent or invalid transactions taking place. Other preventive controls include segregation of duties, recruiting and training the right staff and having an effective control culture. Preventive controls are the first layer in the internal control shield. Preventive controls prevent and discourage adverse events such as fraud, errors, theft, loss, and so on from occurring. Implementing preventive controls and thereby preventing adverse events from occurring is more cost-effective and creates fewer interruptions in the normal operations than detecting and correcting adverse events after they occurred. Examples of preventive controls include the following. Backup of data and documentation. It is vital that backup copies of all important data and documentation are readily available in the event of original data being destroyed or damaged. Backups of important data should therefore be made regularly as per a predefined backup plan. For example, most financial system data is backed up daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly. Files should be backed up on a different storage device, which is also physically removed from the original data storage device, to ensure that the backup data is not destroyed or damaged in the same adverse event that damaged the original data, for example a fire. Backup files must have the same level of protection as the original data and documents, as they contain the same sensitive information and are open to cybercrime, corruption, and destruction as well. Backups must be regularly tested to ensure backup files are uncorrupted and that the relevant data and documents are being backed up. Boys et al., 2017. Antivirus software. This software is used to prevent virus infections on computers and computer networks. Depending on the antivirus software program, the software will scan the computer, computer networks, emails, secondary storage devices, and so on, regularly for viruses. As soon as a virus is found, the program will clean the virus, that is, destroy it. It is very important not to ignore a virus warning from antivirus software. Antivirus software must also be updated regularly to ensure it protects against the latest viruses, Boys et al., 2017. Antispyware. Antispyware is similar to antivirus software. The only difference being that anti-spyware protects the computer and computer system against the installation of spyware. As with antivirus software, anti-spyware must be regularly updated to ensure it protects against the latest spyware, Boys et al., 2017. Spam Management Software Spam management software filters emails to identify spam. If an email is identified as spam, the email is quarantined and not delivered to the recipient's email account. Recipients are informed of the email and can usually request the mail administrator to release the email if it is not spam. If no instruction to release the email is received, the email is automatically deleted after a predetermined time. It is important to allow recipients to identify spam email senders and for the mail administrator to add these spam email addresses to a list of emails that are automatically blocked as spam. A recipient must also be able to remove an email address from the possible spam list so that emails from that specific email address will go to the recipient's email address directly and not be quarantined first. Training of staff Staff must understand why controls are imposed, what the benefits of these controls are and how to execute these controls. This will ensure staff will not try to circumvent controls and that they know how to execute controls properly. For example, they should know how to make backups or why it is important not to share your password with colleagues. Software change and implementation controls these controls ensure that only authorized changes are made to existing software programs or that only authorized new programs are installed on the computer network. Adequate disposal of used slash damaged slash redundant equipment, when hardware reaches the end of its useful life, technological redundancy, damage, etc., a decision regarding the proper disposal needs to be taken in order to ensure that the confidentiality of data is maintained and the negative impact on the environment is minimized, Boys et al., 2017. 8.5 Detective Controls 
These are controls that detect if any problems have occurred. They are designed to pick up errors that have not been prevented. These could be exceptional reports that reveal that controls have been bypassed, e.g., large amounts paid without being authorized. Other examples could include reconciliations, supervision, and internal checks. Examples of detective controls include the following. Programmed edit tests. These detective controls are automatically performed by the application software used in the data entry. Depending on the software program, errors identified can reflect immediately on the input screen to allow the input clerk to take corrective steps instantaneously to rectify the data, or the errors can reflect on an error report created periodically, and the errors must be corrected at a later stage. Some of the programmed edit tests which can be performed include the following. Check digit. A check digit is used to verify the accuracy of an entered numeric code, e.g., bank account number, ID number, inventory barcode. The check digit is usually the last number of the numeric code and is calculated by applying a mathematical formula to the basic code, the other numbers in the numeric code. When the numeric code with the check digit is entered, the computer will automatically recalculate the check digit. If the check digit is not the same, the computer will indicate that the numeric code has been entered incorrectly and must be re-entered. A very simplistic example is the following. An inventory barcode, 756-543-6, is seven digits in length. The first six numbers are the basic code, and the last number is the check digit. The check digit is calculated as the sum of the first three numbers less the sum of the last three numbers, that is, 6, 7 plus 5 plus 6, 5 plus 4 plus 3. If, for example, this specific inventory barcode is entered as 756-643-6 the computer will recalculate the check digit and get 5 instead of 6. The computer will then flag the inventory barcode as incorrectly entered. In practice, the mathematical formulas used to calculate the check digit are very complicated. Mathematical accuracy checks, the computer will re-perform calculations and compare the answers to calculations manually performed. For example, the total of the line items on an invoice must be equal to the original invoice total captured. Alpha slash numeric checks, data fields can be set to contain only numeric or only alphabetic characters. The alpha slash numeric test will then test if the data entered in that specific data field were entered in the correct format. For example, if a data field can only contain numeric characters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and alphabetic characters ABCD, or alphanumeric ABCD 4567, characters are entered into that specific field, that entry will be flagged as an error. Limit checks when data are entered. These tests check whether the data fall within preset limits. For example, the quantity sold for a specific item can only be between 0 and 100, the working hours for casual staff can only be between 0 and 15 hours per week or payment terms must be 30, 60, or 90 days. Activity logs, activity logs indicate which users accessed a certain system and at what time. These logs should be reviewed regularly for atypical activities, that is, users logging in at unconventional hours, as these activities might indicate fraudulent activities. Intrusion Detection System, IDS IDS is software that monitors and logs attempts to access computer system and networks. An intrusion detection alarm is raised if the attempt to access the system falls outside predetermined activity parameters, unsuccessfully trying to access more than three times, etc., or falls within the parameters of possible malicious attacks, the predictable behavior of a worm. An IDS is used to detect attacks from inside as well as outside the organization, Boys et al., 2017. Hash totals, a hash total is created by adding together all the data for a specified non-financial numeric field, e.g., inventory codes, invoice numbers, supplier and customer account numbers, in a batch. A batch is a group of transactions processed together. The total has no specific value other than is controlled to ensure the batch is captured completely and accurately. 
This is done by calculating the hash total for the batch at the start and ensuring that it agrees with the calculated hash total for the batch at the Other examples, detective controls, discussed earlier in this study unit, are Run-to-run -run totals Audit trails Smoke detectors 8.6 corrective controls These are controls that address any problems that have occurred. So, when problems are identified, the controls ensure that they are properly rectified. Examples of corrective controls include follow-up procedures and management action. Clearly, the most powerful type of control is preventative. It is more effective to have a control that stops problems occurring rather than detecting or correcting them once they have occurred. There is always a possibility that it is too late to sort out the problem, ACC underscore CAC underscore BT underscore 202109, 2021. Corrective controls are the last layer in the internal control shield. Corrective controls, also sometimes called corrective measures, commence as soon as the detective controls have uncovered and identified an adverse event. The purpose of corrective controls is to limit and repair the damage caused by the adverse event and should bring the organization back to its normal working operations as effectively as possible. It is important to remember that for each adverse event identified, there can be more than one corrective control and that the optimum corrective control must be chosen to rectify each adverse event. As with detective controls, corrective controls can have the effect of modifying existing controls or implementing new controls, Boys et al., 2017. Even with the availability of more advanced technology, the recovery of data is not certain. It is therefore of the utmost importance to ensure that backups of important documents are made regularly. Backup data restoration, the applicable data backup is restored. This restores the data and information back to the form and was in at the point the backup was made. All transactions between the backup date and the date the backup is restored will therefore be lost and must be redone. It is, therefore, very important to inform all users before a backup is restored to ensure they have a list of transactions that need to be redone. The restoration of a backup is the last option, as redoing work is time-consuming. Please remember that it is very important that backups must be tested regularly to ensure they can be restored. An organization does not want to find out that backups are corrupt and cannot be restored when it needs to restore the data. Data recovery, in the event of a damaged or corrupted secondary storage device, multiple tools can be used to recover data, including specialized data recovery software or the replacement of a broken hardware component, among other things. An operating system failure is the most common reason for the need to recover data and a CD, called a live CD containing a complete, functioning, and operational operating system, can be used to boot up the computer so that the file system error can be fixed. Data and system backups can also be made regularly for data recovery purposes. Other examples of corrective controls are Disaster recovery of complete system, in order to minimize financial loss and prevent a material impact on the financial reporting process, controls should be in place that enable a business to resume normal operations as soon as possible after a disaster has struck the organization. Fire extinguishers, to minimize the damage caused by a fire. Backup power, to minimize the impact of a power outage. Insurance, to recover damage to be able to be in operation as soon as possible. Nine potential threats and controls. Information systems are exposed to privacy and security issues. 
The organization must safeguard the privacy and security of data as well as ensure complete and accurate processing of data. There are different privacy and security risks that exist, together with solutions as to how the organization can tackle each risk. Potential Threat Potential Controls Natural Disasters, for example, Fire or Floor Fire Procedures, Fire Alarms Extinguishers, Fire Doors, Staff Training and Insurance Cover Location, for example, not in a basement area liable to flooding Physical environment, for example, air conditioning and dust controls. Backup procedures, data should be backed up on a regular basis, ideally in real time, to allow recovery. Business continuity planning, to decide which systems are critical to the organization continuing its activities. Malfunction of computer hardware or software. Network design, to cope with periods of high volumes. Backup procedures and business continuity planning, as above. Unauthorized access, usage, damage or theft. Personnel controls, include segregation of duties, policy on usage and compliance with regulations such as GDPR, hierarchy of access. Access controls, such as passwords and time lockouts. Computer equipment controls, to protect equipment from theft or destruction. Viruses, a small program that, once introduced into the system, spreads extensively. Can affect the whole computer system. Antivirus software should be run and updated regularly to prevent corruption of the system by viruses. Formal security policy and procedures, for example, employees should only download files or open attachments from reputed sources. Regular audits to check for unauthorized software. Potential threat. Potential controls Hackers, deliberate access to systems by unauthorized persons. Firewall software, should provide protection from unauthorized access to the system from the Internet. Passwords and usernames, limit unauthorized access to the system. User awareness training and a formal security policy so that employees are aware of the risks that exist and how best to mitigate them. Data encryption, data is scrambled prior to transmission and is recovered in a readable format once transmission is complete. Human errors, unintentional errors from using IS. Training, adequate staff training and operating procedures. Control sensoring on the valitata is input processed and that all data is processed. Human resource risk, for example, repetitive strain injury, RSI, headaches and eye strain from computer screens, tripping over loose wires. Ergonomic design of workstations should reduce problems such as RSI. Anti-glare screens reduce eye strain. 10 Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery Most organizations now expect to be subject to a cyber attack. Therefore, Part of the cyber risk management process must be to set up business continuity plans and disaster re recovery plans, although the use of these plans is not limited to recovery from cyber attacks.
Business continuity planning is proactive and designed to allow the business to operate with minimal or no downtime or service outage whilst the recovery is being managed. Disaster recovery planning is reactive and limited to taking action to restore the data and applications and acquire new hardware. Disaster recovery planning takes place in order to recover information systems from business critical events after they have happened. It involves Making a risk assessment Developing a contingency plan to address those risks Examples of backups that organizations use now are Mirror site, this is effectively a complete copy of a website but hosted on a different URL, web address. It can be used to relieve traffic on a server to speed up performance of a website, or it can be used if the main website goes down for any reason. It is a very expensive approach, but if something is business critical, it could be cheaper than the costs incurred as a result of not having one if something goes wrong. Hot Backup Site This is a building that physically replicates all of the current data center slash servers, with all systems configured and ready to go with the latest backup. Warm Backup Site This is a building that has all the critical hardware for the servers and systems in place, but they will need to be configured and the most recent backup of the data slash information installed before the site can take over the organization's activities. Cold Backup Site this is an area where, should anything go wrong, new hardware could be set up and a recovery operation could begin. None of the hardware needed is actually in place, so it would take a significant amount of time to restore operations. This is the cheapest option. The location of backup facilities is also an important issue. If the backup facilities are too close, they may be taken offline along with the primary site. If the backup facilities are too far away, that could impact on operations. Finding the right balance for an organization will require significant consideration. There are also third-party providers who maintain sites, which could be cheaper but could also create problems with ensuing compatibility. Third-party providers are likely to have many other commitments to other clients, and this could impact the availability and accessibility of the backup in a disaster, particularly as disasters can impact various organizations at the same time. ACC underscore SIMAC underscore P3 underscore 202201, 2021 colon 583. 11. Privacy. The amount of personal data available to and used by organizations means that the privacy, sensitivity and security of this data are very significant considerations in modern business. In the context of the organization, privacy refers to all information that is considered confidential and in need of protection from public disclosure. Privacy has become an important issue owing to the vast amounts of data being made available to stakeholders of organizations. In most organizations, information is computerized, making it easily accessible. It is important that proper control measures be put in place to ensure that information is managed as well as that it reaches its intended recipients only. Individuals must respect the value and ownership of the information they receive and should not disclose any of its contents without the appropriate authority unless there is a legal or pro professional obligation to do so, Boys et al., 2017. 12. Protection of Personal Information On July 1, 2021, the Protection of Personal Information Act, PAPIA or the Act, 4 of 2013, came into effect. The Act has implications for all research activities that involve the collection, processing, and storage of personal information. PAPIA provides for a general prohibition on the processing of special personal information. Special personal information includes information relating to the health, political persuasion, race or ethnic origin, or criminal behavior of the data subject. There is a similar ban on the processing of personal information relating to a child. 
There are some exceptions to these bans. It provides for the development of codes of conduct to guide the interpretation of the Act with respect to a sector or class of information. Prior authorizations are required for using unique identifiers of personal information in data processing activities, and for sharing special personal information or the personal information of children with countries outside of South Africa that do not have adequate data protection laws. In order to understand and functionally interpret the provisions of PAPIA for the research community in the Republic of South Africa, South Africa, the Academy of Science of South Africa, ASAF, is leading a process to develop a code of conduct, code, for research under the Act. During 2020, ASAF was approached by scientists in South Africa to consider the development of a code for research. Within the research setting, PAPIA regulates the processing of personal information for research purposes and the flow of data across South Africa's borders to ensure that any limitations on the right to privacy are justified and aimed at protecting other important rights and interests. The new regulatory system that PAPIA established functions alongside other legislation and regulatory structures governing research in South Africa. The law which takes precedence will be that which provides the most comprehensive protections to the rights of individuals in South Africa. Twelve point one processing of personal information. PAPIA provides for the lawful processing of personal information in South Africa. It sets out the roles for various parties involved in the processing including collection, use, transfer, matching and storage, of personal information. Briefly, these roles include but are not limited to The responsible party, which, in this case, is the researcher, principal investigator, or research institution responsible for determining why and how the personal information is being processed. The operator, a third party contracted by the responsible party to process personal information on their behalf. An information officer who is the designated individual within an institution responsible for ensuring compliance with PAPIA. The data subject who is the person whose information is being processed and, in the case of research, would be the study slash research participant. 12.2 Conditions of Lawful Processing of Personal Information PAPIA outlines 8, 8, conditions for the lawful processing of personal information, all of which must be fulfilled for such processing to be lawful. These conditions are Accountability, the responsible party must ensure that all the conditions for the lawful processing of personal information laid out in PAPIA are complied with at the time of the determination of the purpose of processing and during processing, Section 8. Process limitation, the responsible party must ensure there is a lawful basis for the processing of personal information, that such processing is necessary for a defined purpose and could not be achieved without processing such personal information and that the information is collected directly from the data subject and with informed consent, sections 9 to 12. The lawful basis must be determined at the outset of the processing and will influence the rights of data subjects. The following lawful bases outlined in PAPIA are in section 11, 1. The data subject or a competent person where the data subject is a child consent to the processing. Processing is necessary to carry out actions for the conclusion or performance of a contract to which the data subject is party. Processing complies with an obligation imposed by law on the responsible party. Processing protects a legitimate interest of the data subject. Processing is necessary for the proper performance of a public law duty by a public body, or Processing is necessary for pursuing the legitimate interests of the responsible party or of a third party to whom the information is supplied.
Further guidance in this regard is provided under the code. Purpose specification. The collection and processing of personal information must be for a defined purpose. Records should not be retained longer than is necessary and must be deleted or destroyed after the purpose for collection and processing has been fulfilled. The retention of records containing personal information is allowed for research purposes where there is a specifically defined need to retain such information and where further relevant safeguards are in place, sections 13 to 14. Further processing limitation. Further processing of personal information is permitted where such information is used for research, and only for research purposes, section 15. Information quality, personal information collected and stored must be accurate, up-to-date, complete and not misleading, section 16. Openness, responsible parties must maintain a record of all processing of personal information. The data subject must be informed regarding why the information was collected, who collected it and where it is being held what rights the data subject has to access and delete or correct the data, and if the data will be transferred to a third party and or internationally during the processing. It is not necessary to inform the data subject of the above if their information is being processed only for research purposes, sections 17 to 18. Security safeguards, responsible parties must ensure that personal information is kept secure to maintain confidentiality and integrity, and to prevent data breaches. Any security breaches must be reported to the Information Regulator, Sections 19-22. Data Subject Participation, the responsible party must ensure that the data subject is informed of their right to access, correct and delete their personal information and of the manner in which to do so. Sections 23 to 25. In a paper delivered by Nechikuma, 2020, in a consultative workshop to formulate code of conduct, it was established that most participants were not aware of the papia, and a lack of collaboration existed between the legal practitioners, records managers, and archivists. Internal control systems with information communication technology, ICT, need to be in place to provide information integrity, and the value of international integrity about the international students and staff. 12.3 Social Implications If the PAPIA is not properly implemented, it can contribute to the violation of information integrity of the international students partaking in research and cultural exchange programs. Internationally, it can affect SA trade relations with European countries if requirements for non-European Union General Data Protection Regulation GDPR, are not followed. It is also essential for the PAPIA to be aligned with international norms and standards such as GDPR. 13. Ethics Ethics is defined as the moral values and principles of an individual. It is a rule or set of rules that is composed to maintain professionalism and guide members of their profession to assure the public that a profession will maintain a high level of performance. If the rule is not met, it means that the professional has not achieved the standard, which can be considered as malpractice, vid Yuri, 2018. The King 4 report regards the exercise of ethical and effective leadership by the governing body as corporate governance. Ethics plays a critical role in moving from tick-box compliance to genuine application of corporate governance. Ethical leadership is exemplified by integrity, competence, responsibility, accountability, fairness, and transparency, iCraft. It involves anticipating and preventing or at least ameliorating the negative consequences of organizational activities and outputs on the economy, society, the environment as well as capitals that it uses in affects. Thus, ethical organization made up of ethical individuals will act responsible and fairly, even when nobody is watching. Accounting scandals such as Enron and WorldCom have raised a great deal of attention on ethics. The publication of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002 was an initial response. 
Ever since then, ethics is considered important enough to be taught in universities and included in the accounting curriculum. Despite all the efforts, accounting scandals remain. Thirteen point one ethics and the individual professional accountant. In an information environment, the individual may act unethically for various reasons. These may include self interest or familiarity with organization information, or because of intimidation by a dominant senior staff member trying to influence the decision making process. Ethical behavioral cannot be taught as it is not based on rules and regulations. Although an action might be legal, it might not necessarily be ethical. The test for ethical behavior is to ask oneself the question, what is the right thing to do in this situation? A professional accountant is required to comply with the following five fundamental principles. Fundamental Principle Interpretation Integrity Integrity means being straightforward, honest and truthful in all professional and business relationships. Objectivity Objectivity means not allowing bias, conflict of interest, or the influence of other people to override your professional judgment. Professional competence and due care. This is an ongoing commitment to maintain your level of professional knowledge and skill so that your client or employer receives a competent professional service. Work should be completed carefully, thoroughly, and diligently, in accordance with relevant technical and professional standards. Confidentiality. This means respecting the confidential nature of information you acquire through professional relationships such as past or current employment. You should not disclose such information unless you have specific permission or a legal or professional duty to do so. You should also never use confidential information for your or another person's advantage. Professional Behavior This requires you to comply with relevant laws and regulations. You must also avoid any action that could negatively affect the reputation of the profession. 14. Understanding Ethics in the Accounting Profession Public accounting as a professional career is born from the need to train people in a technical, professional and ethical way so that they specialize in and are responsible for the management of the finances of a natural or legal person. Thus, a presentation of financial reports with reliable figures in order to improve the decision-making processes in the management of any organization is needed, Hermandez Gill et al., 2019. Accounting is therefore a service, while the provision of service should be directed to specific interest. Ladigdo and Kamayanti, 2012, argued in their study that accounting harmonization, through adoption of International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, favors the interests of investors. They established that multinational companies, MNC, as the leaders of neo-globalization, have a goal of expanding areas of power and increasing their wealth. This was because most corporation managements are still at a physical level, that is, very egocentric, rather than at a spiritual level, which is community-centric, resulting in the growth of a capitalist culture which is the culture of having. In this regard, an important question that may direct ethics purpose as well, needs to be answered. The question relates to who the users of information generated by accountants, both in financial and audit, are. Thus, it is crucial to ensure the confidentiality of users of audited financial statements and other services provided by public accountants. This requires a good audit quality, generally measured by adherence to the audit process, and standards established and approved by the Indonesian Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Therefore, as an independent party, public accounting as a profession requires the trust of the public and the reliability of those statements.
Accordingly, quality financial reporting also demands a qualified auditor. Notwithstanding, awareness of the importance of financial statements for stakeholders is still not sufficient, Jaya and C. Irene, 2016. Building on the idea that birth cohorts, otherwise known as generations, are useful proxy for the socio-cultural environments of different time periods, it is believed that the perceptions of accountants of the millennial age group, young workers and students born in the 1980s and 1990s, and the so-called Gen Me, are particularly important for the future of the accounting profession. After all, it is these young people who will become professional accountants or the accountants' future clients. Specifically, the factors that contribute to influencing Gen Me perceptions of accountants' ethics are levels of education, having attended an accounting course at high school level, gender, and membership of accounting professions, Calio and Cameron, 2017. Accountants and Ethics The growing concern over the ethics of professionals makes it important considering the perception of the public, students, and accountants of the values of accountants in the working world. Building from the above about the accounting profession, the function that accountants fulfill in the economic system is dependent on their ability to maintain the perception of high ethical standards. However, according to Hernandez Gill et al., 2019, creative accounting is a scourge that affects the organizational and professional ethics of those who consent to committing fraudulent acts for the simple reason of accommodating figures and showing a reality that does not correspond to what is truly executed. Therefore, accountants as students need to possess certain essential personal qualities that their employers look for. The study by Calio and Cameron 2017, indicated that there is room for improving public perceptions of accountants' ethics through university courses in ethics, continuing education programs and focused communication strategies by accounting firms and professional bodies. 14.2 Forensic Accountants and Ethics According to Brian Howison, 2018, although being ethical is identified as an important characteristic, the question of what constitutes a good forensic accountant has not hitherto been investigated. This is because of the multidisciplinary and highly technical nature of forensic accountants, as they are significantly at risk of conflating ethics with compliance with law. In this regard, prior literature has identified several technical and personal characteristics and attributes that are desirable in forensic accounts practitioners. The understanding of virtue ethics and especially the virtue of practical wisdom will help forensic accountants maintain public confidence and quality in their service and provide practical guidance on the exercise of professional judgment. Practical implications suggest that the primacy currently given in forensic accounting literature and practice to a commercial logic technical competence risks damaging the professional standing of forensic accountants. Over time, it will reduce their ability to exercise professional judgment in complex, unstructured situations. In this regard, virtue ethics can act as a useful counterpoint to these threats. 14.3 Perceptions on Ethics Between Teaching Accountants, Accounting Students, and Accountants Prayogo, Tenku Afrizal, 2021, conducted a study on the difference in perceptions between teaching accountants and accountants on the ethics of preparing financial statements, and ethical indicators for the financial preparation of financial statements as represented in earnings management, misstatements, disclosures, cost-benefit, and responsibilities. Results showed that teaching accountants, accounting students, and accountants have different perceptions. However, there were no differences in perception between teaching accountants and accountants. Therefore, it was concluded that there are differences in perception between teaching accountants, accounting students, and accountants on the ethics of preparing financial statements. 14.4 Basic Principles for Auditors' Ethics In carrying out their duties, auditors are expected to always be guided by the basic principles of professional ethics, which are Principle of integrity, 
Every practitioner or auditor must be firm and honest in establishing professional and business relationships in carrying out his work. Principle of Objectivity Every practitioner or auditor shall not allow subjectivity or conflicts of interest to influence professional judgment. The Principle of Competence and Attitudes of Professional Precision and Awareness, Vid Yuri, 2018. 14.5 The Effect of Electronic Information Technology, IT, Systems and the Auditor's Ethics on Audit Quality. The interaction between electronic IT systems and auditor ethics affects the quality of audit. Based on theory, the interaction between electronic IT systems and auditor ethics has a positive effect on audit quality. Electronic information technology-based systems are indispensable for auditors in complex audit assignments, where analytical, rapid decision-making and communication among audit teams is essential. Electronic-based information systems, IS, are needed for decision-making oriented to professional consideration and complexity of the assignment. The electronic IT systems support IS used by auditors in the assignment of audits. An understanding of ethics will bring the auditor up to speed with attitudes, behavior, and action necessary in maintaining the quality of audit, Prayogo, Tenku Afrizal, 2021. 15. Governance Governance outcomes, corporate governance is not presented as an end in itself but rather a means towards realizing certain benefits, or governance outcomes, such as ethical culture, good performance, effective control, and legitimacy. The principles are an expression of the fundamental aspirations of any organization wishing to achieve corporate governance. For example, King 4 provides the following principles, among others, for a governing body. It should lead ethically and effectively. Govern risk in a way that supports the organization in setting and achieving its strategic objectives, among others. Ensure the organization remunerates fairly, responsible, and transparently so as to promote the achievement of strategic objectives and the positive outcomes in the short, medium and long term. 15.1 Corporate Governance and the Financial Crisis The credit crunch is increasingly presented as a crisis in corporate governance. The regime of corporate failures came on the heels of the global financial crises of 2007 and 2009. This emphasized the fact that corporate objectives, goals, and priorities had been compromised by organizational or corporate gatekeepers. This results in a breakdown of planning, control, and evaluation phases in corporate management. These gatekeepers, as represented by accountants, auditors, corporate managers, and the regulatory authorities, have in some way been implicated in this gruesome dance of death. Global response to this downward spiral is twofold. First, there has been a renewed emphasis on the overhaul and adoption of Uniform International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, with an eye to best practices. Second, corporate governance principles and practice are emphasized to avert the misadventures of the past. 15.2 Objectives and Importance of Corporate Governance Corporate governance is the means by which a company is operated and controlled. The aim of corporate governance is to ensure that companies are run well in the interests of their shareholders, employees, and other key stakeholders such as the wider community. It deals with the mechanism by which stakeholders of a company exercise control over corporate managers and provide overall direction to the firm such that the stakeholders' interests are protected. In such situations, the firm operates more responsibly and profitably, relations are enhanced between the firm and all stakeholders, shareholders, policyholders, employees, suppliers, and society at large. The quality of executive and non-executive directors is improved, the long-term information needs of all stakeholders are satisfied, and executive management is monitored properly in the interest of shareholders.
The aim is to try and prevent company directors from abusing their power, which may adversely affect these stakeholder groups. For example, the directors may pay themselves large salaries and bonuses whilst claiming they have no money to pay dividends to shareholders. Similarly, they may be making large numbers of staff redundant but awarding themselves a pay rise. In response to major scandals, for example Enron, regulators sought to change the rules surrounding the governance of companies, particularly publicly owned ones. In the United States, U.S., the Sabarnes-Oxley Act, 2002, introduced a set of rigorous corporate governance laws. The UK Corporate Governance Code introduced a set of corporate governance initiatives into the UK. The King Committee on Corporate Governance periodically produces a booklet of guidelines for the governance structures and operation of companies in South Africa, SA, called the King Report on Corporate Governance, King Report. It has been cited as the most effective summary of the best international practice in corporate governance. Compliance with the King Report is a requirement for companies listed on Johannesburg Stock Exchange, JSE. Three reports were issued, in 1994, King I, 2002, King II, and 2009, King II, and a fourth revision, King IV, in 2016. The first report, King I, when published, was recognized internationally as the most comprehensive publication on the subject, embracing the inclusive approach to corporate governance. The Institute of Directors in SA, IODSA, owns the copyright of the King Report and the King Code of Corporate Governance. Unlike other corporate governance codes, such as Sarbanes-Oxley, the code is non-legislative and based on principles and practices. It also espouses an apply-or-explain approach unique to the Netherlands, and now also found in the 2010 Combined Code of the United Kingdom, UK. The philosophy of the code consists of the three elements of leadership, sustainability, and good corporate citizenship. One of the definite fallouts of the Enron saga was a global preoccupation with the twin challenge of corporate governance and corporate accountability. 15.3 Information and Technology As we learned in earlier study units, information, like technology, is a growing source of competitive advantage for the enhancement of the intellectual capital of an organization. For serving its customers more effectively, King4 recognizes that information and technology overlap but are also distinct sources of value creation, each of which has its own risks and opportunity. King4 takes cognizance of the advances in technology that are revolutionizing business and societies in transforming products, services, and businesses' models. To reinforce this distinction in King4, the code now refers to information and technology instead of information technology. Principle 12 provides that the governing body should govern technology and information in a way that supports the organization, setting and achieving its strategic objectives. So profound are these effects that many believe they herald the dawn of a fourth industrial revolution, as they cause significant disruption. In line with King Ivy's assertion that risk often creates opportunity, organizations should strengthen the processes that help them anticipate change and respond by capturing new opportunities and managing emerging risks. The practices assist the governing body to do so. 15.4 Role of Accountants in Good Corporate Governance the role of an accountant is to maintain a proper balance between the components of the system to ensure that the audit and accounting tools are performing proper governance roles and that the pillars of good governance procedures are well in place. They must keep a governance checklist on the front burners to ensure that the auditing and accounting tools serve an overall governance in the firm. In this regard, the role and responsibilities of accountants can be comprehensively explained as follows. The primary task of an accountant is to ensure that there is a checklist of good corporate governance practices. It is not enough to define in theory the roles of the different components of the governance structure, more importantly, those components must be seen to operate efficiently in design and effectively in operations. The responsibilities fall rather heavily on accountants to help the company ensure full compliance with the requirements of good and effective corporate governance. Firms with good corporate governance frameworks are usually fraud resilient. In the final analysis, it is part of accountants' duties to ensure that companies
Implement Enhanced Board of Directors Oversight of Fraud Risk Management. Appoint an executive level member of management responsible for fraud management. Establish formal fraud control policy or strategy. Implement risk management goals, performance measurement, and periodic process evaluations. Coordinate efforts of different functions to reduce overlapping activities and address risk management gaps. Formalize roles and responsibilities of the board, audit committee, management and staff related to fraud risk management. Ultimately, the role of the accountant is to aid proper corporate planning, setting achievable standards, establishing reporting, monitoring and evaluation standards, and crafting an overall vision for the enterprise. Accountants also aid the setting up of proper controls, efficient and effective audit systems, good fraud risk management, and full, fair and adequate disclosure that satisfies international standards and best practices, Benjamin Chuko Sisioma, 2013. Fifteen point five advantages of a company following good corporate governance principles. These are the following Greater transparency, Greater accountability. Efficiency of operations. Better able to respond to risks. Less likely to be mismanaged. 